welcome to My Career in Data, a podcast where we discuss with industry leaders and experts how they have built their careers. I'm your host, Shannon Kemp, and today we're talking to Dr. Daniel Parshall. With a robust catalog of courses offered on demand and industry-leading live online sessions throughout the year, the Dataversity Training Center is your launchpad for career success. Browse the complete catalog at training.dataversity.net and use code DVTALKS for 20% off your purchase. Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer at Dataversity and this is My Career in Data, a Dataversity Talks podcast dedicated to learning from those who have careers in data management to understand how they got there and to talk with people to help make those careers a little bit easier. To keep up to date in the latest in data management education, go to dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. Today, we are joined by Dr. Daniel Parshall, the principal data scientist at Lakeside Software. And normally, this is where a podcast host would read a short bio of the guest, but in this podcast, your bio is what we're here to talk about. Daniel, hello and welcome. Hey, Shannon, how are you? Good. How are you doing today? Good, good. Excited to be here and uh, yeah, looking forward to our conversation. Oh, me too. Okay, so let's dive in here. So you're the principal data scientist at Lakeside Software. So tell me, what type of business is Lakeside Software? Right, so we uh, specialize in what we call the digital employee experience. And uh, the idea is that we are um, helping to sort of um, uh, shed light on the darkest state, right? So we help um, uh, uh, technical teams, IT teams, who might have you know many thousands of devices spread across um, you know a, a large organization, there are going to be constantly issues with, um, you know, everybody's computer's always got something a little bit wrong with it. Uh, and so we help provide the tools to help them identify those issues so that they can resolve them. Because one of the things that gets employees very frustrated is when their, their digital experience uh, is bad, is when they their computer doesn't work, their meetings don't work, you know, their computer is always slow, that, that kind of thing. Uh, so that's really what our focus is. And, and we really care in particular about helping to identify the, the silent sufferers. Is what we call them, those people who are, you know, maybe very frustrated with their computer experience, but for whatever reason, um, you know, they haven't gotten the help they need. Uh, and so that's just one of the things, that, you know, there are a few things we care about, but that is one of the things that we really care about and, uh, you know, where we try and help surface those sorts of insights uh, to the IT folks. Oh, I love that so much. Um, and so as the principal data scientist, what is it that you do? Right. So me in particular, I, I'm doing what we call, I'm, so I'm helping to build AI that speaks IT. Mm -hmm. That's our sort of catchphrase for this whole concept. Um, as you might imagine, we have tons and tons and tons of data. Um, and it gets to a certain point where it gets hard to sort of filter through that. And so I, I am working on, along with our uh, DevOps and our data architecture and engineering teams on helping to surface those sorts of things. And we're using uh, uh, AI and ML in order to do that, in order to make finding those kinds of things easy so that then people can find resolutions. Oh, very, very cool. This, uh, I love the whole initiative to make people's lives a little bit easier because you're so right. I mean, tech is so great when it works and it's so nice, but it's so frustrating when it doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> so, so tell me then, how do you work with data in your job? Right. So, um, well, so I've, I've been a few different places as a, as a data scientist. Uh, one of the things that is really great about our data here is that it's extremely clean, mm. uh, certainly in comparison to, to some other places, because uh, almost all of it, it's, it, you know, it's machine telemetry data. So it's all data that's provided by the computer, basically about the condition uh, that the computer is in. So we don't have a whole lot of those um, uh, human entered fields where like it's a free text field where anybody can just kind of put whatever they want. Uh, there are some times and places when that kind of thing is great, but from a data scientist perspective, it's often kind of messy uh, and difficult to use. Um, but because so much of our data is uh, machine generated and generated by our client, uh, so we have what we call a client program that actually sits on the individual devices. Mm -hmm. uh, and then that collects all kinds of data. And they are very, very, um, or we are very, very, um, let's say proud of uh, our very limited impact. There are some uh, programs, and I shall leave the nameless, uh, there are some programs that end up consuming a lot of the machine's resources yeah. in their quest to find this kind of stuff. And then that leads to a lot of impacts down the road. So we collect an awful lot of data, but we do so while just sipping at the machine's resources. 
So um, we have all kinds of data there. Uh, and actually, we, we are a petabyte scale organization. We have a lot of data. We, we collect, yeah, we collect uh, what we, we say 10,000 data points every 15 seconds. Wow. And yeah, and that's actually a pretty good summary. Yeah. Um, not every single piece of data is collected every 15 seconds. That would be a little redundant. And some data we record, we collect on a cadence more frequent than that and just record it every 15 seconds. But, but that is a scale we are working on. And when you think about that spread across um, um, an awful lot of machines, uh, that's an awful lot of rows of data. And we get into that petabyte scale very, very quickly, but we're distributed across millions of machines. So as you can imagine, that, that creates some fun uh, technical challenges. Oh, indeed. <laughs> uh, and, you know, and just to reiterate the point that, you know, you working with clean data, um, you know, a, a problem, I'm sure that makes your job so much easier when you go to analyze it and figure out what you need to do with it. Yes, absolutely. So having that clean data makes uh, building all those pipelines and things like that. You know, people say data scientists spend an awful lot of their time, uh, you know, munging data, uh, getting it into a condition that you can use it. And that is a, a much smaller fraction of the job here than it has been in some of my other places. <laughs> yeah, and I, and I bring that up because, you know, as you say, you know, and we'll get into those uh, in a bit here too. Uh, um, you know, we've seen so many uh, and hear about so many AI and machine learning initiatives failing because their data isn't clean. So hence I, I, I go into that, uh, bring that up. Yeah, so um, um, often we wanna make use of this data and often organizations have a lot of data, but because that data isn't clean, a lot of it's not necessarily valuable. Mm -hmm. um, or it can be made valuable, but it takes it takes time and effort. Actually, I have a whole little taxonomy of data that I've come up with for presenting to people about, um, um, you know, the different ways that data can be bad and the different ways that data can be good and sort of how you can move from one point to the other. Um, but there are some times when an organization thinks, oh, we have a lot of data, we need a data scientist. Um, but really, they need actually a, a much cleaner pipeline in the first place. And it's not, and you can do stuff with dirty data. Don't don't get me wrong. But um, for the most part, models are going to produce, uh, you know, it's a classic, you know, garbage in, garbage out, right? Models, uh, just like any other kind of computer program, or even even like humans ourselves, uh, is going to, is based on the data that it has. Right. And if that data is, is bad in some way, if there's, especially if there's systematic issues, that's one of my big things, then that's going to lead to, um, uh, to problems with the output as well. And so I think one of the data scientists really critical jobs is uh, being aware of those kinds of things and uh, helping to make that clear, uh, not just to like the other data scientists, but helping to convey that to uh, to management and upwards so that then they can help drive uh, things that happen in the organization. Very, very nice. All right, well, let's back it up a little bit and so we can talk about how you got to where you are today. Okay, so, so tell me, Daniel, um, when you were very young, say six years old, was this the dream? Did you say, I'm gonna grow up and be a, Principal data scientist. <clears throat> um, I, I did actually know that I always wanted to be a scientist. Yeah. Uh, and so even from a young age, I, I wanted to be a physicist. Mm -hmm. um, and and I actually did that. I, I did my PhD in physics and then spent a number of years, um, you know, sort of out of this professional working scientist and, and basically the equivalent of a tenure track role. Um, but at, at some point I realized that I was... Um, um, the, the things that were exciting to me, I realized that, you know, like some of my other colleagues were reading, um, you know, uh, physical review letters on the weekend. And by that point, I had started reading like the quarterly journal of economics mm -hmm. um, because I was just getting interested in other kinds of problems, um, mm -hmm. not just the physical problems, but I was really wondering about how some of these things that uh, I had learned sort of applied in the real world. And uh, in a lot of ways, physicists have it really, really lucky because so many problems in physics sort of separate out cleanly. So um, for almost always, not literally always, but almost always, the electrons don't care what the nucleus is doing. Like, and when you throw a baseball, you're not worried about like the spin orientation of the electrons. Like those things generally don't matter. And so the problems sort of separate out cleanly. And so you, that you can attack a problem at one scale without influencing uh, the other things. And, and that makes it easier to gain traction on these problems. But it turns out that in the real world, uh, that isn't always the case. And if you implement like a, a program to say like me measure teacher effectiveness, uh, the teachers aren't gonna continue doing exactly what they were before you implemented the program. Right. They're gonna respond to those changes that you've made. 
And so separating out those kinds of things um, uh, is, is really, really challenging. Uh, the economists in particular spend a lot of time and effort on trying to find cases and ways that they can do that. Um, but, but just this whole idea of like causal inference and, and sort of figuring out what's really going on was that, that has always been something I really loved. Um, even though I, no, nobody at the time when I was a small kid said, I want to be a data scientist. Um, <laughs> but yeah. you always wanted to be a scientist, which, I, which yeah. is, I love it. I love that. And so, um, what, okay, I have to ask what area of physics did you special? Uh, yeah, so, so I did um, what, what we call condensed matter physics, which is uh, basically like uh, um, sort of like everyday stuff, like not um, uh, astrophysics, which is the stars and not like nuclear physics, which is like the structures of the, um, you know, the internals of the atoms but um, uh, trying to figure out why um, um, a lot of material science kinds of things sort of work. So um, my, my catchphrase, and we, we can talk about this if you want to, uh, that I actually think it's very important for people to be able to explain what they are doing at different levels of technical detail. So my one sentence phrase was, uh, I studied how um, sound waves interact with electricity and magnetism. Mm -hmm. And I like that one very much because people feel like the, 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 all three of those words, the important words in that sentence, people feel like they, they mostly understand. And, and to, to varying extent, they actually do. Uh, and I could leave it at that. But then if somebody was more interested, then I could get into a little more detail. And I could talk about um, the, the tool, the technique that I specialized in was, was what's called neutron scattering. And uh, so we would you know, basically shoot a beam of neutrons at a target that we wanted to study. And then you look at the ways those bounce off. And then you, you collect uh, the data about where they've gone and you can infer something. And if somebody was interested in that, I might talk about how if you've ever been driving past like, a, like an orchard or something like that, you know, I, I, if, you, if you notice you, you're sort of driving past it, it all just looks like a really big mess. And then mm -hmm. you get to a certain point where the, the, the position you're in lines up with the, the pattern of the orchards and it snaps into position and you can see everything really clearly. And then you go just a little bit further and it all becomes a big mess again. And then a little bit later, it snaps into position again, and then it becomes a mess again. And then, so if you were a particularly um, mathematical kind of person, you, you might be inclined to say, hey, can I figure out how those trees are arranged just from my position along the highway? Um, and it turns out you can. And, and that was actually the kind of thing we would do. So you shoot the beam of neutrons in, and then you turn the, the specimen, the crystal typically that you're studying. And uh, when you get to the right position, you'll get a reflection. Uh, that reflection will become a lot more intense and you can figure out what is happening with the positions of those atoms based on the way those are bouncing off. And then you can get more, and then there's more and more detail than get. You can actually get into, um, if they lose energy, you measure the energy on the way in and measure the energy on the way out. You know that there was, um, you know, maybe a sound wave that they were interacting with and, and you can get deeper and deeper and deeper, but you can start from that very high level and explain it in, uh, you know, everyday terms, like an apple orchard, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then dig deeper and deeper as people need to. Uh, but the key thing is that you can explain, and I think a genuine way, um, you know, what it is that you're doing. And so one of the, uh, the key pe pieces of advice that I think is going to be especially relevant for your students is that uh, a data scientist can't say, just trust me. A data scientist needs to be able to explain to people, um, at least on a high level, what's going on inside the model and, and why, because otherwise people are likely to feel like you're trying to bamboozle them or something. Uh, and even if they're not necessarily in an adversarial relationship, they still wanna be able to understand it well enough so that they can make decisions about it. Uh, and so one of the things that's been very useful in my career is being able to explain to non-technical folks the, the, the essence of what's going on inside of the model, uh, you know, while leaving out the, the technical parts that, that oft oftentimes, a mistake I see junior scientists make, uh, a mistake I see junior scientists make is trying to explain a model using the math or using the technical details or something like that. And typically the other folks you're working with, they mostly don't care about that. They kind of want to know what goes in. They want to understand at a very high level what happens and then they want to understand what comes out and how to act on that. Uh, so that, that is, I think, a piece of advice that's very helpful for the others. Oh, I love that. So, um, so really early on, so you, you're in college, you know, following your passion for science, you know, I could, I could, I would love to go down a rabbit hole with you, but to keep to the, to the point of the podcast here, um, you, you followed a passion and, you know, and 
you know, as you mentioned, there's many areas of physics to to go into. So um, that's where you landed in terms of your your interest, your curiosity of what you wanted to figure out. Um, uh, and then, you know, uh, and data practitioners struggle with this all the time. You know, we, I talk about this with one of our regular webinar series um, speakers, you know, it, explaining what we do is really hard. Um, you know, and, you know, what, what a data management is, is, you know, often people just don't understand. So learning, communicating is a skill you learned right away to explain what you're doing um, uh, so that you could engage with other people, which I love. Um, okay, so now tell me, so you, so you, you major in physics, now you, you, where did, where did you go from there? Okay, so so my 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 own research at the time was starting. We were moving from gathering sort of one data point at a time to gathering whole swaths of data points at a time, uh -huh. uh, and so that you know got so I started working on programs to analyze this and be able mm -hmm. to make use of even as the tools were coming out. You know, sort of the older guard of physicists was still, you know, they were going to these machines that was collecting you know bazillions of data data points at once, and they were analyzing one tiny little piece of that data. And mm -hmm. I was like, I feel like there's a better way to do this. So I, I was digging into, can we gather all this data, sort of use all this data at once? That got me interested in, um, in computer science. That got me interested in big data. And I was like, oh man, this would be such an interesting field if only this were 10 years ago. Uh, but, but I guess I want to, the reassurance I want to offer to your, yeah, you know, your crowd is you can absolutely make that career change. Um, yeah. Especially if you're in a, just sort of a highly technical field, uh, you know, life is there are, a huge number of physicists turned data scientists. Um, I myself was a little bit nervous about making that transition. So mm -hmm. I talked to uh, a number of different people who had you know, left academia and gone into, gone into industry and a number of people who had you know, specifically gone from physics to data science. Uh, like I said, there's, that's a big, it's a much bigger group than you might expect. Um, and um, uh, you know, basically what I heard from everybody was, you know, hop on, jump on in, the water's fine. Um, you know, there, there, obviously there's things that are, uh, um, no matter where you go, there are things that you like more, there are things you like less. Some of those are individual to the person, but absolutely you can make that change even if you're, you know, uh, in your 30s or 40s. Um, and so you can learn, especially with technical things, um, um, most of us who have been in academia and, and done, you know, PhDs or things like that have learned to pick up technical stuff very, very quickly. A new field comes out, a new material comes out, something, and you, you dive into the data and you... You, you, you dig in. Um, that ability is invaluable in any area. And, and since leaving uh, physics, I've worked in aerospace, I've worked in uh, ed tech, I've worked in entertainment, and now I'm working in IT. Um, and uh, you don't necessarily need to know every single thing. Uh, you absolutely need to be able to understand on a high level what's going on. But there are going to be domain experts in whatever field you're in. Like I worked in aviation safety. I am not an expert in aviation safety by any means, but there were a lot of, of, um, of SMEs, of subject matter experts that were at uh, the place I worked, MITRE. It's, a, it's a, um, basically a, 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 sort of like a contractor for the federal government. It's more complicated. I'll leave it out. Um, but at MITRE, one of the really powerful things that was that we had people who had been in almost every role within aviation. And so my office mate had been an air traffic controller. So hmm. when something would come up, I, I could turn to him and I could get great and immediate feedback from him. Um, so whenever I started approaching a part of the problem that I wasn't quite sure how to handle, um, there was somebody there who did have that experience. And, you know, obviously he didn't know how to build machine learning models, but with a little bit of us going back and forth, we could figure out, you know, what it is that I needed to understand in order to be able to make my, my next step. Um, so even if you don't understand, so that's what you can always make the career change. And even if you don't, uh, are not a su subject matter expert, you can still work with people who are in order to be able to figure out, uh, in order to be able to gain traction on a problem and move forward. I love that. Uh, being willing to ask others for help and, and understanding and, and really leaning on others. And, and that's great advice too. The interest, to, the willingness to, uh, and the ability to change careers at any at any time in any stage of of life, and it sounds like it's been a very lucrative. Um, and uh, you're enjoying what you're doing now. Um, the, 
he's mentioned a couple different industries, you know, um, so what was the path then as you went from uh, uh, collegiate uh, work into the enterprise business? You mentioned aerospace, uh, then where did you keep going and why did you keep transitioning uh, into the different roles and now IT? Yeah, um, so um, um, like a lot of people, when I started getting into this, I um, worked through some of the Coursera courses. I think the Andrew Ng course is sort of, um, um, you know, almost a kind of a badge of honor, at least amongst a certain certain time period of, of um, people moving into data science. Um, and uh, that gave me a lot of the, the, the nuts and bolts. Uh, mm-hmm. I then did a um, uh, sort of like uh, an incubator program that specialized in taking people who already had PhDs mm-hmm. and uh, giving them the, te- the skills, the additional skills that they would need to transition from being um, you know, academics to uh, sort of ind- industry data scientists. Uh, that one I did was called the data incubator. And I will say that there was a little bit of value in that um, because when people are hiring a data scientist, they are often, it's very difficult to evaluate somebody's competence in a field that you yourself don't have any expertise in. And so that's why one of the things that, that uh, one of the very useful things can be these accreditation programs. Mm-hmm. So at least once or twice when I was talking to people and I was able to say, oh yeah, it's not just that I've been a physicist and not just that I've written computer programs for analyzing physics data, but I was able to say, you know, I did this um, um, specific program for transitioning from data science or from uh, regular science, academic science to data science. And uh, that was often very useful to them because they're like, oh, okay, there's, uh, you know, somebody along the way who is able to sort of like confirm <laughs> that this that this guy knows what he's talking about um, in, in a way that I can't evaluate on my own. Um, um, so that that was helpful. Might not be right for everybody, but I will say that it, at least a couple of places, at least for that first job, certainly, uh, mm-hmm. that definitely made that transition easier. Um yeah. So, um, yeah, I was in aerospace for a number of years. There were actually a lot of really great things about that. That was also enormous scale, like multi petabyte scale data there. Uh, we had our own cluster and the analysis. Uh, I, I think being my first job out of data science, I didn't or out of um, academia into into sort of it was a sort of a midway point between the real world. Uh, and I didn't really appreciate just how much uh, effort they had gone into into making the data clean. Uh, they, they actually had a whole traceability program. So they, they had a, all kinds of computer programs that took the original raw data, which was like radar hits, and processed that and stitched everything together and did all kinds of analysis and all kinds of steps along the way. Uh, but they had a data management program that, um, um, that, that <laughs> looking back, I slightly drool over. Um, literally every single data point they had, uh, yeah. and I could have something that would like said, when was the moment when the airplane took off from the runway? Uh, I could find an individual data point and I could trace uh, all the, that through that hierarchy that every single derivative point all the way back to the original raw data data hits, radar hits. Uh, so they had a, a, a sort of a, a, an inheritance program that, so every single data point, it was like, what points was this derived from? And then for those points, what points was this derived from? And for those points, what was this derived from? Um, in a way that not necessarily everybody needs. Um, I, you know, it can depend on, on, on what you're doing, but in terms of, you know, my, in terms of me being able to find problems, or when I found a problem, in, when something didn't, when something you know looked fishy or smelled wrong, um, I could uh, trace it back as far as I needed to, until I found the place in our algorithms, in our data processing pipelines, where that error had crept in. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was I was sort of the king of this. I filed something like a hundred bug reports in a year, um, and uh, I, I will say I felt possibly useful to your to your students. I when I first started identifying problems, I felt a little bad because sort of in academia, if you like point out that somebody's paper's flawed, people could be very sensitive about that. Um, but I think software takes a very different approach. And you know, bug reports are seen as a way to improve the product. Right. And if you're good at finding so so a it's just not no, nobody takes it nobody writes bug free software so nobody's offended when you say they have a bug. There's that, uh, but if you're able to, to sort of sort it sort it back like that and figure out, so I find I, I, there's a bug and I think it comes from here, and uh, that that can be really really valuable uh, to people and they can really appreciate that. Um, yeah, so um, 
so that was the first part I was in in um, uh, this aviation safety. Um, uh, I heard about this role at an ed tech company. I'd always been interested in education. That was one of the things that I really did like about academia. And um, so I, I moved into that role um, and was there for a couple of years. We were doing some interesting things. The company got uh, bought out and then broken up. And the part I was, a lot of my favorite projects went with the, the other, uh, with the other spinoff. And um, uh, so that was a little disappointing. Um, so that that's sort of, uh, impelled me to start looking for uh, uh, other kinds of opportunities. Um, I moved into a role at an entertainment company. Um, on a very high level, we were sort of building meta recommendation engines. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's your typical, like um, Amazon looks at your past uh, browsing history and your past purchases and things like that to try to recommend uh, what you might be interested in next. We were doing that in sort of a meta level, uh, helping like, for instance, streaming platforms say, okay, well, here's the kind of customer, here's the kind of market segment you're interested in. And based on the, the data that we have, um, here are the kinds of uh, content that you might like to license that would be, you know, so sort of a, a recommendation engine for the people who are providing recommendation engines, um, if that makes sense. Um, uh, yeah, that was a, a surprisingly technical group. Like it, it sounds like it would be just a sort of an easy peasy uh, kind of thing. It was, it was a very, very super technical. They were, they were uh, super smart and uh, um, yeah, a lot of it really not to sound like a, one of the things that, that sometimes fairly um, uh, techies get accused of is being more excited about the tech than the actual work. Um, so I'm going to, at the risk of doing that, I'm going to say, yeah, that the tech stack we were using was amazing and they, they were really leveraging uh, a lot of really great techniques uh, in order to do these kinds of things. And I learned a lot about the sort of the, um, the, 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 a lot about the software side of things as well, you know, using, you know, CI, CD and having good unit tests be part of your thing and, and um, uh, those kinds of things. Um, yeah, so um, the, that, the company basically folded when, uh, when the, the most recent financial crisis hit and the price of money went up and uh, they decided to pivot that was the kind of thing that companies five years ago were willing to invest a lot more time and the people were willing to do sort of long time horizon stuff and wait for a while. Let's focus on growth and we'll get, we'll make profit later. Um, but uh, the most important number in the world is the Fed rate. And it turns out that when that, when that goes up, uh, people start focusing on a much shorter time scale. And so they weren't willing to, yeah. So that company decided that they wanted to, to focus on the here and now uh, and not some pie in the sky research project. Um, so they, they, they folded, they let, they, they cut the entire team. Um, and then, uh, so I started looking for my next position. Um, uh, I, I found this role at Lakeside, which was a really great mix for me of my sort of soft skills, my love of teaching, my love of finding non-technical ways to explain technical ideas, uh, plus also the technical work as well. Uh, and I think one piece of advice that I would give to your students, um, is that, if you can, finding places where the data itself is a core part of what the company does is is really great. Uh, coming from academia, of course, the point of everything we did was the data. Moving out of an academic role, I was hit rather hard with the realization that other people don't care about the data in the same way that I did. And um, so that was um, uh, a little bit of a, you know, a little bit of a culture shock thing for me. Um, but that that's going to be different at every organization. Mm -hmm. And the more central that data is to what the company does, then the more, uh, it, partly the more contribution you can bring about, um, but the more buy-in you'll have from management. If you want to do something, you want to make a change. If you have an idea, uh, the easier it is to sell people on that idea. Um, you know, the closer the data is to, to, to their, 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 their core essence. And that's one of the things I love about Lakeside is that all what we do is collect data and then try to make it accessible. So um, here we're just now getting into the, uh, the uh, AI ML sides of things. So from my perspective, it's great. There's a lot of uh, sort of low hanging fruit. There's a lot of easy wins. Uh, I think that's important if you're coming into a company uh, especially when they're starting to just open up that role is look for some, some easy wins so that you can get some buy-in, convince people that there is value in what you're doing. 
uh, and then that'll make it a little bit harder to say, okay, this next thing I want to do is a little bit, I, I need a little bit more, you know, this one's got a longer time scale, but it's, you know, but if they've already seen the value that you can deliver uh, and you've already got that, you know, that, that a um, uh, couple of wins under your belt, it's a lot easier to move that forward. Very have, nice. Yeah, go ahead. No, feel free to comment on that. There's one thing that I definitely wanted to bring up and, 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 and add, but we don't need to do that. We can do that whenever you like. I just didn't want us to forget about it. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. Well, I'm going to ask, you know, right now. So this is fascinating. I, I love, again, this uh, mixed medium of science and communication. Uh, you know, what, so what has been your biggest lesson so far in your career? I mean, you've mentioned a couple of prominent ones, but what's the biggest one? More and more companies are considering investing in data literacy education, but still have questions about its value, purpose, and how to get the ball rolling. Introducing the newest monthly webinar series from Dataversity, Elevating Enterprise Data Literacy, where we discuss the landscape of data literacy and answer your burning questions. Learn more about this new series and register for free at dataversity.net. Um, I, I will use this to jump into the, to the, the, this, this point I make. So a lot of times uh, people at every level think that um, um, sharing insights means sharing data. Mm -hmm. And that is not true at all. You can absolutely share insights without sharing data. And that is one of the, the, the drums that I constantly beat and one of the things that I wish I could shout from the rooftops. Um, so, you know, great example, you know, if you've got, uh, you know, in medicine, you do a study, you want to find out, you know, what, how some, um, get more information about how some particular disease works. You can um, gather a bunch of data about all of your individual subjects, uh, but then you can condense that information and you can write like a scientific paper. Uh, and then later on, other researchers can take several of these papers and they can combine the results from all of those separate papers. This is called a meta-analysis. And they can do a meta-analysis and get more insight and nail down the numbers more precisely, get a deeper insight into you know, how, how uh, some, something might work, uh, while still never, ever needing to have seen that raw patient data. Uh, and so uh, um, me in particular, I've been very interested in the privacy end of things. Mm -hmm. And so understanding that there are ways that you can maintain uh, privacy, and, and in many cases, like mathematically, provably, and that comes along with like legal, that meets legal guidelines as well. Um, um, so that has been huge for me and understanding, referencing our earlier uh, bit here, that you can't just say, trust me. Uh, so being able to find those places where, um, you know, one of, one of my great finds was a, a legal article that got a group of lawyers together with a group of computer scientists and they analyzed what's called differential privacy, mm -hmm. which is a way of, um, differential privacy is basically a promise that a data holder makes to a potential participant. And it says, I would like you, I, you your data would be, a, would be valuable to, to me if you joined. The more data we have, the, the better it is. But I understand that you might have your own reservations or all kinds of things that you might be worried about. So I will promise you that I will add noise to any answers I generate. And I promise you that I will add enough noise so that nobody will ever be able to tell if you were involved or not. And so in that case, since you, so it makes no difference um, um, whether or not your uh, data, whether or not your data record is part of my database or not. Uh, so you might as well let me use it. Um, and your privacy will be, and that's the difference in differential privacy is the difference between that person being included or not. So I promise that I will, so I will, I will analyze the situation. Whenever I get a question, I will calculate the answer. I will analyze how much uh, you know, how much uh, noise might be needed in order to protect you and every other person. And I promise you, I will add enough noise that it will be, you know, uh, uh, whatever, nearly, this is where you get to the math speak, right? Like uh, almost certain, quote unquote, um, you know, what, uh, yeah, but you can do, you can do the math on this. You can make, you can make a, a privacy budget. There's a lot of cool math involved, um, but it also uh, meets the legal guarantees. And so this group of lawyers worked with this group of um uh, computer scientists, and they analyze it in the context of one specific law. In that case, the law was FERPA, the Federal Education Rights Privacy Act. This is while I was at the EdTech company. Uh, so then being able to go to our legal counsel and say, hey, you don't just need to trust me. Look, this analysis has already been done. 
Um, and so we can, we can do this. We can, sh you know, find a way because all of our customers wanted to take advantage of the data that all of the other customers had, but nobody wanted to risk their data. You know, so, so, so this is very, right. this is very, um, uh, you know, um, navigating that, mm -hmm. um, you know, was an important thing and being able to, to, to show people at all of these different levels, um, you know, both at this legal analysis had been done, you know, but also I came up with like sort of intuitive explanations, especially where I could give like the meta analysis example, things like this, being able to explain um, uh, that and provide those sorts of concerns to people, you know, address those concerns uh, to all of the different stakeholders. Um, and I think that is something that certainly when you're starting out, you don't really appreciate. Um, but I have definitely learned is that so much of what you really need to do is understand what the other stakeholders are concerned about and make sure that you can address that. And that doesn't mean explain it away and say, just trust me. That means you really have to listen to them because sometimes they have a concern that you really didn't think about. And um, so when they have a concern, so you really need to listen to people and filter through I think this is a little bit hard for technical people because we want to express everything in technical terms. And since not everybody else thinks in technical terms, you need to listen to them, hear what they're saying, and uh, try to find a way to repeat it back to them and make sure you understood that concern so that you can really address it. Uh, and one of the things that I've done throughout my career is I've basically looked for, uh, not necessarily mentors explicitly, but definitely people I wanted to emulate. Um, and there was one guy I worked with who was just great. He would, just, he would get to a meeting Everybody, argue, he wouldn't say, he wouldn't, he wouldn't say a damn thing. He wouldn't say a word. He would just listen for about 15 minutes and like let people hash it out, let people go back and forth. And then he would say, okay, I want to pause. He said, and what I'm hearing is, so what I understand the issue is, or what, whatever. And he would repeat back to people, here's what it sounds like you're concerned with. Um, you know, and, and oftentimes I would just be stuck. I'd be like, yeah, he nailed that. Um, so that's one that I have definitely taken and run with and tried to make sure that I could do is this. Um, find understanding the concerns of your stakeholders, even when they're not expressed in mathematical formulas and uh, being able to address those concerns, uh, you know, in, in a way that will satisfy them is, is huge. And that is, I say, what, probably the single biggest difference between junior data scientist and principal data scientist. <laughs> oh, I love that so much. So, uh, and I'm really excited to hear the, your answer to this next question. I ask everybody, you know, what is your definition of data, especially coming from the background that you do? <clears throat> uh, that's great. I have a lot of thoughts about what, I have a lot of thoughts about <laughs> ways to have problems in data. So data is going to be some sort of information about the world as a scientist, it's about like these, you know, it's about these materials I'm studying or whatever. Uh, as a business, it might be about like customers. Um, you know, it, it can be lots of different things, but it's it's some information about the world that you can put together in a systematic way to make decisions and change what you're doing. If the data is never going to change, if you're going to do the same thing anyway, the data doesn't make a difference. Don't bother, right? Um, if um, Henry, Henry uh, Poincaré, the, the, the French physicist, said, um, you know, science is built of facts the same way that a house is built of bricks. But a pile of bricks is not a house and a random collection of facts is not science. So even if you have a lot of data, if you have a lot of individual data points, a lot of what um, we can do is uh, provide the, the, the sort of the organization so that you can make a decision based on, it. especially in business, what people really, really, really care about. Um, it, you know, in science, you kind of just, you know, I'm just kind of curious. I just kind of want to know. Um, but in the business world, especially, uh, being able to use data to make decisions is critical. And so, I, so that's why I would say it's, it's, it's going to be data, information about the world that lets you make a decision. There's a lot of steps along the way. There's a lot of value add for data scientists along the way. Uh, but that's what I see as, as sort of the key point. And I, this also points to a whole bunch of places where you might have problems, et cetera, et cetera. But I think I if I'm going to sum it up in one sentence, information about the world that lets you make a decision. Oh, love it. So then do you see the importance of data management and the number of jobs working with data increasing or decreasing over the next 10 years and why? Yeah, I, I think we're definitely going to see more and more of this. Um, I think, uh, you know, 
uh, as companies are <laughs> I sort of sort of like I mentioned earlier, some companies are like, well, well, let's just grab a data scientist and throw them at the problem. Um, and you know, as any data scientist knows, if the data is really bad, it's hard to work with. It's hard to it's hard to, to get that data from that random collection of facts to that house that you would like to get. Um, and there's a lot that needs to happen along the way. And now I think we're starting to see this differentiation into these different roles. Um, you know, we're starting to see data engineering roles. We're starting to see machine learning engineering roles as people are realizing, oh, this isn't just one uh, one point. There's there's a whole pipeline of stuff that has to happen along the way. And so I think there's going to be a lot of growth um, into those roles and a lot of specialization within those roles in order to make that happen. Um, but I will, uh, yeah. But absolutely, being able to explain what you were doing and why you were doing to management in a way they can understand. That is going to be useful for a long time. Yeah, I, I don't disagree. Uh, you know, and then what, what advice would you give to people looking to get into a career in data management? Sure. So I, like I said earlier, I, you know, I was, um, you know, I think my um, my mid thirties when I made the jump myself, you know, and at that, uh, at that time it feels like, oh man, I've invested so much time in physics. Um, you know, can't, can I really do this? So I would say uh, you can definitely make the transition you know, at, at any state, even if you're a mid-career uh, person, you can definitely make that transition. Um, and if you're interested in it, and if you, you, you find a lot of things fun and exciting, then, you know, then of course that just makes it easier. Okay. I'm going to add one more question here. You know, I, you, you mentioned so much, you know, about the pipeline and the points leading up to the, uh, the data science portion of things and the AI and machine learning portion of things. So, you know, again, I, you know, we hear so many stories of, you know, executives saying, okay, we just need to do AI and then, but we don't need a data model or we don't need data management, <laughs> you know? And I get people asking me all the time, like, how do I express that? Like we need data governance. We need a data management strategy before we do all of these things. What would, what advice would you give to executives looking to get into, into these uh, more advanced technical options? Uh, so I think I, I, I like this metaphor, you know, that I had earlier of of talking about the the pile of of um, uh, facts is not science. The pile of bricks is in the house, and if you just have a bunch of random bricks that you you know that was just dropped off, um, you know, at the, the dump yard, mm -hmm. uh, it's not going to work very well, right? Uh, there are a lot of pieces that go along the way. Um, you can, if you if you have good governance and you can make promises to people about how you will respect their data and their privacy and their, you know, the, the things that, that are concerns to them. Uh, and that's gonna be different for every industry, right? Those are some of the, 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 the common ones. Um, but the more you can show people that you are taking their concerns seriously, then uh, the more they will trust you with their data. And this has especially been true over the last few years. I've seen a real hard pivot myself from 10 years ago, nobody cared about what tech giant was gobbling up what, uh, people are like, ah, it's fine. Um, and now people are starting to pay attention to that. Mm -hmm. um, and so you, um, yeah, so I think um, being able to show people that that their concerns about how you're treating their data are valid and that you are addressing those concerns uh, may helps build that trust so that you can move forward. So I think that's a big one for C-suites and their customers. I think for the interface between, like say, C-suite and data scientists, uh, I would say, that um, um, yeah, just because you have data doesn't necessarily mean you can do something with it uh, unless you're willing to invest the time and energy into uh, cleaning it up. I, I have a whole taxonomy of like when what what are the ways that data can go bad, uh, but one of them one of the points is if you don't know anything about where the data came from, it's useless, right? If you have a a, a column in your database table that says speed and there's a number there, but nobody can tell you whether that's uh, miles per hour or meters per second or what, you know, then, then it's useless. Um, and that point in particular led, led to um, um, the, uh, the, the Mars rover crash, right? There was one team that calculated the data in miles per hour, even though NASA specifically says in their documents that it must be meters per second, but they did just went and did it anyway. And that's especially insidious because the difference between miles per hour and meters per second is, is about 2.2. Uh, a factor of 2.2. So it's not quite, you know, if you see that something's going, you know, uh, 30, uh, you know, in meters per second, that, 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 you know, or miles per hour, that number is like the ballpark of what's reasonable. So you can't use your intuitive checks about like, um, I, I once had a velocity, 
in our this, one of the ones I found in our air, aircraft data set. I found an aircraft that, at least for this one um, section, was reported as having a speed that, when I worked it out, was greater than the speed of light. And I was like, all right, I don't know a whole lot about aviation, but I can tell you that this is wrong. Right. <laughs> yeah. But but that was one place where I was able to see a, a value that obviously didn't conform to reality. Right. right? Yeah. Uh, but if you have no context for your data then you can't apply any of these sorts of sanity checks. And when, you know, uh, and so you can be, uh, at least in this case, disastrously wrong without knowing it. So, um, you know, I, I think there is a whole environment that needs to go with that in order to produce, you know, good output, good clean data that then data scientists can build off of. Um, and there, like I said, there's a, there's a whole bunch of different pieces that go in all along the way, but, being able to build a pipeline that takes the raw facts, the, the raw little bits of information and can clean that up progressively so that you can emerge from a haystack with like a nice shining needle of insight. Yeah, I love it. Oh, well, Daniel, it has been a pleasure. Thank you so much. You know, I, and I'd be remiss if I didn't ask um, if somebody was interested in Lakeside software, uh, how would they go about finding you? Uh, so uh, we are lakesidesoftware.com as our web address. Um, we have um, yeah, products for customers. I think that the AI portion is particularly brilliantly designed, um, but that's it's mostly a proud <laughs> parent talking rather than, no. Um, um, yeah, but no, we, we do a lot to try to um, um, sip at the resources, gather a bunch of data, and then service that up to provide insights that can lead to actions. Ah, I love it. Uh, well, thank you so much for this conversation. Very helpful and insightful. Um, I really appreciate your time today. Absolutely. It was a pleasure and uh, uh, look forward to chatting with you again sometime. Agreed. Well, and to all of our listeners out there, if you'd like to keep up to date in the latest in podcasts and in the latest in data management education, you can go to dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. Stay curious, everyone. Thank you for listening to Dataversity Talks, a podcast brought to you by Dataversity. Subscribe to our newsletter for podcast updates and information about our free educational webinars at dataversity.net forward slash subscribe.